Uh, first of all, wow. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, I'm Rosanna Jackson. This is Claire Repper. We're both third year medical students. Um, so we're going to talk to you about our summer project today. Um, and as Barbara said, thank you. Um, the, our project was about the first five female medical graduates uh, from here at the University of Aberdeen. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about who they were um, and about sort of issues they faced and how they're still uh, relevant today. Um, so first of all, let's do say a very, very big thank you to our supervisors, Professor Pacey, um, Dr. Bodkin and Dr. Dr. White, and of course to Dr. Bob Clark, um, who's come here tonight as well. So we'd just like to say thank you so much to, to all of you. Um, um, so I think we'll just, I'll just do like a brief uh, sort of context um, before we get started with our biographies. Claire and I are going to talk about the biographies, and then Professor Pacey is going to talk about widening participation, and Dr. Stephen Lynch is going to talk about sort of women in medicine today. Uh, so, um, just a bit of historical background. Um, so, women have existed in medicine um, sort of since humanity started, really. Um, it was very much seen as a domestic task, um, which women did. Um, and it wasn't until the 16th century, um, under the rule of King Henry VIII, that uh, women were banned from medicine and surgery um, by basically what we know today as the Royal College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Physicians. Um, and... Um, so since then, um, they were banned, women were excluded from the profession for medicine and surgery for the next 300 years. Um, and it wasn't until the sort of age of enlightenment um, happened um, sort of 300 years later when women were, um, when sort of there was more awareness of uh, uh, human rights. So um, women started to sort of get into medicine any way they could. For example, one of the most notable uh, people was Dr. James Miranda Barry. Um, who was a woman and she dressed as a man for her whole life um, to just sort of to be a doctor essentially and it was only discovered that she was female um, after she died. Um, similarly women were also going abroad to study medicine so places like Switzerland and America and then they'd come back um, to the UK to, um, to practice medicine after they'd got the um, their qualifications. Two of the most notable pioneers at the time, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and Sophia Jex Blake, um, they were um, pioneers who used um, university loopholes and they also travelled as well. So they went over to places like America and came back and they became doctors and they used their um, position to um, basically campaign for women's rights in, in medicine, particularly in, in uh, education, particularly medicine, particularly medical education. Um, at the time as well, like um, at the turn of the 20th century, when our project sort of the women uh, lived um, that we studied, um, there was a sort of greater need for women treating their own as it was deemed inappropriate for men to treat women, particularly pregnant women. Um, so there was this need for women to treat their own. So that helps, as well as the, the legislation which happened, which was the Enabling Act um, in 1876, um, and also after that, there was the University of Scotland Act in Scotland. Um, so that was in 1889. So on top of the legislation and the sort of changing of views, it was more appropriate, it was more able for women to access medicine. Um, in Aberdeen, there was a similar picture going on in the University of Aberdeen. Um, despite the um, uh, University of Scotland Act, which allowed women to matriculate into universities, um, it wasn't until it's about the Enabling Act, sorry, um, and allowing women to come into education. It wasn't until the University of Scotland Act that women were actually able to graduate. Um, however, this, was, uh, this wasn't compulsory. So in Aberdeen, it wasn't actually, the uh, University of Aberdeen, it wasn't actually allowed, women weren't actually allowed until 1892, um, which was a few years before our first um, female graduate. So, and that, so that took, all took a while. Um, and our first uh, graduate came to the University of Aberdeen in 1895, and the first one was Myra Mackenzie. The first woman, so Myra Mackenzie, she was born in Perthshire, and she came over to, she came up to Aberdeen for university um, in 1895, and she graduated in the year 1900. Um, as you can imagine, a woman coming into medical school being the only one at the time when women weren't perceived to be able to study education, not just allowed, but not physically capable. Um, you can imagine the sort of attention she received. Um, but despite this, she did really well. You know, all the women we studied in our project did exceptionally well. They all won medals. They all won prizes. So we're very proud of them. 
um, and she did she did very well. Although the the teasing she got, it wasn't just from students; it was also from staff members as well. They used to have competitions to see who could embarrass her the most. Um, so it, it's one of these things. It's it's quite unbelievable today that this this happened. Um, after leaving medical school, she moved around the UK quite a lot. She moved to London, she moved to Staffordshire, and she moved to Sheffield. Um, she worked in all these places, and at the time, she was also um, part of the suffrage movement. Um, uh, we're unsure if she was part of the suffragists or the suffragettes um, at this time, but we know she was in the suffrage movement. And towards the end of the First World War, she actually moved, um, she was over in Macedonia and Serbia as part of the Scottish Women's Hospital, um, and she worked over there, and seeing the sort of the harrowing um, features of war really, you know, prisoner of war camps and there was one particular source which said that one of her um, patients, if you like, she she went into the local village and there was these starving children who had been playing with bombs at the side of the road and so they had to amputate their little kids' hands. So we can only imagine the horrors that she saw out there. Um, upon coming back, she moved down to the Lawn Mental Hospital um, down in Lincoln and that's where she stayed for most of her career. Um, she became the superintendent there and she had very modern views on psychiatry, um, similar to sort of the views we have today, where she said psychiatry and um, mental health, is, mental illness is just um, an illness like any, like any other that needs to be treated and that can be treated. So much more like we, how we think of mental health today. Um, and so she stayed there until about the 1940s and then she moved back to London for a little bit. And in, by 52, 1952, she'd retired and then she died at the age of 81. Um, still in London in 1957. Um, so that was Myra. Our second female graduate um, is Jeannie McLeod. Um, and this is a particularly sad story, um, um, which has been really interesting to, to read about. And very sad. Her life tragically ended very soon after she graduated. Um, very sad. Um, she was from Edinburgh. She was born in 1970. Um, and... Uh, um, she came up to Aberdeen, she was schooled in Aberdeen, she went to the Aberdeen um, High School for Girls. Um, she demonstrated absolutely outstanding academic prowess all through her career, all through her uh, academic, um, her educational career. Um, she completed school and then did the St Andrews LLA qualification and she won honour, she achieved honours in every subject she studied, which is quite an amazing feat. Um, and then she moved up to Thurzo. Um, where she taught French and German at the Miller Institution up there for a few years, and then she went to medical school in 1890, 1897, sorry, so many dates. Um, and uh, she, so she was the second female graduate. She graduated in 1902. Um, during her time in medical school, she had a sort of similar experience to Myra McKenzie. She was the only woman in her year, um, and we know that she wrote letters home to say that her, her male colleagues were sort of teasing her and, and mocking her. So we can't imagine again how difficult that would have been to be the only woman in such a male-dominated profession. Um, and a point she did extremely well at university as well, like over in the display, just in the atrium, there's some of her medals that she won. Um, so she did extremely well despite that. She also was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. For example, she was the first president of the Women's uh, Medical Society and she was part of the Literary Society as well, just to name a few. Um, um, after graduating, um, Jeannie worked over in the Children's Hospital. Um, however, unfortunately, by the end of the first week, Jeannie was dead. Um, she died. She died by suicide on the 2nd of May, um, 1902. Um, and... It, <laughs> It's, she was just 28 years old, um, so it's a very tragic story um, for, for Jeannie. She, um, it's impossible to know what was going on with Jeannie at the time. It's impossible to know the circumstances around her death. Um, she may have been suffering from a mental illness that was long-standing, or something might have happened to her um, more recently that, um, in her life that, that really affected her grief or, or that sort of thing. It's impossible to tell, really. Um, let, um, reports from the family suggest that at the time there had been an operation which had gone wrong um, which may, might have left Jeannie feeling crippled with guilt and um, there was also an outbreak of pertussis at the same time, a whooping cough um, and that left 136 children dead by the end of, uh, sort of that week so that must have been a harrowing feat for any doctor um, to experience as well. 
Um, on the death certificate, the final cause of death on the death certificate was death by suicide while suffering from temporary mental aberration, which was a diagnosis given to the deceased to make them innocent of the crime of self-murder, um, which allowed for Christian burial. And it also gave some comfort to the family as well. Um, and uh, in the newspapers, her death was widely reported. However, the, the, um, there was sort of little to no empathy shown really by the, by the newspapers, um, sort of showing, demonstrating the lack of awareness of mental health and mental illness at the time um, as well, um, which is sort of still reflected today really. Um, so that was Jeannie. Um, and our, uh, one of our uh, second sort of uh, one of our the third female graduate, these three, there were three of them, and Claire's going to talk about the next two. Um, they graduated all together. There were three of them in the same year. They graduated in 1903. Um, one of them uh, is Bill Copeland Smith, I'm going to talk about. Um, born and raised in Aberdeen. Um, she went to medical school, and you know, similar to the other, to the other uh, graduates we've talked about, again, did very well at medical school. Um, she uh, left in 1903, and I'm assuming would have had quite a different experience to, to Myra and Jeannie, who she wasn't the only woman in her year. Um, she left medical school and she actually married uh, another Aberdeen medical graduate um, in 1905, so just a couple of years after they left, they uh, married down in London and they had a couple of children together and settled down in Sussex for a time. And just before the war, um, they moved back up to London and she... Um, volunteered with a sort of military support organisation during the war called the um, First Aid Nursing Yeomanry and she was also sort of working with the sort of London General Omnibus Company as well. Um, however, from the end of the war, sort of around 1920, she and her husband were like, they had different registered addresses, they were both still in London, but had different addresses and they, they stayed um, apart during that time. So we can only speculate why, um, whether it was a separation, divorce would would be unlikely at that time, but um, we can only sort of speculate why. Um, but we, it could be a reason that she sort of started her career then, because up until that time on the census, she was retired, um, and then she sort of started a career in paediatrics after that. Um, so between sort of 1920 and 1940, she was, um, she was working in sort of infant welfare, maternity, um, and she was also like a, um, a medical officer for health, I think. And she was also part of the Institute of Hygiene, I think, so I think she did a bit of community work. Um, and she worked until about sort of the 19, late, mid-1940s. And she, in 1947, she was admitted to a nursing hospital in Surrey um, with the effects of old age and pernicious anemia. Um, and she was quite frail at this time. And she lived here for about a year. And then in the summer of 1948, her dressing gown caught fire. There was like a wee gas fire in her room. And she was admitted to hospital with second degree burns. And unfortunately, she contracted, she got bronchial pneumonia and then died um, as a result of that at age 70. So that was her. So I'm going to hand over to Claire now. So I'm going to speak about... Oh, sorry, microphone's working now. Uh, I'm going to speak about the fourth of our five graduates. And the next one is Margaret Duncan, who was born in Turriff in Aberdeenshire. Um, her dad was an architect and her mum was a teacher. And she started university again in 1898. Um, she was very successful in anatomy. She won the Fife Jameson Anatomy Medal and the Struthers Anatomy Medal, which was awarded for dissecting the muscles of facial expression of man. Um, after her su success at university, she graduated in 1903, two days after her birthday. And then in December of 1903, she started working in um, a children's hospital in Sheffield as a surgeon. She remained in Sheffield for the remaining four years, but kept close ties to the northeast of Scotland. Um, she would come up to events such as the Tariff Industrial Event, where she once won Best Tea Towel. And um, also, she was on the Prue House Committee um, for Aberdeen as well. Um, she then, in, 18, uh, in 1907, sorry, she married William Rattray Perry, who was an anaesthetist at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And he was also one of the lecturers at the medical school. And he would have uh, lectured at the time that Margaret Duncan was a medical student. So after they married in 1907, this is where things take a bit of a sad turn as well. Uh, in January of 1908, she had her first son, uh, John Riddle Knight Perry. But sadly, the day after childbirth, she died. And um, on the death certificate, it said the cause was cardiac failure. And in modern times, that wouldn't be considered an acceptable cause of death. Um, we can only speculate on what it might have been. Um, it's symptomatic of a lack of understanding of medicine at that time. Um, and it may not have even been from a cardiac cause. However, what remains kind of striking is that she was a doctor and her husband was a doctor and they were unable to prevent the cause. 
Um, what also uh, is something that has remained pertinent today is maternal mortality, albeit maternal mortality rates have significantly decreased since that time and the nature of maternal mortality and the causes have changed greatly as well. Cardiac disease remains one of the, lead the, sorry, the leading indirect cause of maternal mortality to present day and work is still being done to improve that care. So her husband, William Rattray Perry, he raised his only son and then remarried and he served in the First World War and won an OBE for his services. Um, he remained a well-known doctor within Aberdeen and um, up until his death. So I'm going to move on and speak about our final graduate that we studied, and that's Isabella Gunn. She was born in Falkerbers, and her dad was a farmer, but sadly her dad died seven months before the birth of his uh, youngest son. And that meant that Isabella Gunn's mother was left to run a farm and raise ten young children. However, um, she managed to do that very successfully. Uh, two of her children went to medical school and another one um, also studied at university. And Isabella Gunn attended Aberdeen University again in 1898, um, where she was the president of the Women's Medical Society and she actually sent a letter of condolence to Jeannie McLeod's family upon the death of Jeannie. And she was also in the Christian Society. In, um, in 1903, when she graduated, um, she married uh, Reverend George McGlashan Kerr, who was a uh, Methodist minister. And in 1907, as part of the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society, they moved to uh, the south of India um, to start some missionary work. Her husband um, would preach to the local village people in an area that covered about 250,000, and she would treat the um, local community as well. And it was in this time that she noticed a high instance of leprosy in the area, um, and she noted that the state actually had no provisions for the, uh, for the people with leprosy either. So in 1911, with the help of a local Hindu, she managed to set up a leper home. Um, such was the demand that the leper home grew to over uh, 250 acres with help from donations from um, Christians as well as funding from the state. And, um, but unfortunately, her job was somewhat hopeless, as she described it. Um, a lot of her work involved take, uh, palliative care, essentially, because of the nature of the disease of leprosy. Um, in some cases, it could be somewhat hopeless and a somewhat painful death as well. So this changed in 1920 when um, she heard of a new treatment that was being developed in Calcutta um, called Chalmugra oil. Um, and she brought it back to the Ditch Pali leprosy home uh, and she tried it on her patients and she discovered that the death rate dropped from 20% to 4% within one year. Um, so as an aside, the efficacy of Chalmugra oil is still debated to this day of whether it worked or not. But in Isabella Kerr's case, um, she believed that it did work and the results were shown with a decrease in death rate. So after her success, she was awarded the Kaiser I Hind Medal, which was awarded to the emperor, uh, awarded by the Emperor of India to Isabella Kerr. And it was given to anyone who basically boosted the PR of Britain in India at that time. Um, and she um, continued to be successful, treat lots of cases of leprosy, up until her death in her own hospital in 1932, um, where she died suddenly of pneumonia. Her husband then moved back to Scotland to live with his daughter, um, and there ends, I think, the stories of all the five graduates that we had. So I'm just going to touch upon some of the themes that we noted um, in our studies, because that was the other half of our study, was looking at the five women, but also the issues that were pertinent today. I've touched on maternal mortality, but the other aspect that we've kind of discussed as well is mental health. So Myra McKenzie was involved in psychiatry and Jeannie McLeod sadly died by suicide. And suicide uh, with doctors remains a real occupational hazard today. So in 1858, it was noted that physicians had a higher suicide rate than the general population. And it's something that remains today, particularly in young female doctors, with the suicide rate for female doctors being up to four times higher than the general population, and for male doctors being up to 1.5 times higher. A similar trend is seen in medical students with up to 50% experiencing burnout and 10% experiencing suicidal ideation. And the causes for that have been widely studied with things such as... Um, uh, for, in case of medical students, for fear of being on their academic record, for stinting career progression, the stigma of mental health, and the fear of breach of confi confidentiality, to name but a few. Um, and it's something that, again, still needs to be worked on today, and has been widely discussed in the press recently as well. 
The other aspects that we looked into were widening participation, because initially that's what it was all about. We went from only having men to letting women in, and we wanted to look and see what other groups were being discriminated upon. And um, we also looked at the careers of women as well, and the progression and how things have changed over the last few years. And I think uh, Professor Patey is now going to talk to you a bit about widening participation, and Stephen Lynch is going to talk a bit about um, women in medicine today as well. Thank you, Claire. Um, before I, I start, I just um, would like to acknowledge the work that Claire and Rosanna have done. They've done a fantastic job. Um, in six weeks, they've pulled together um, all this research, um, a huge report, and the display that you'll be able to see un under the stairs if, if you have time later on. And, and we're very proud of the work that they've done as well. So they asked me to talk a little bit about widening participation. Um, and I suppose the first thing is just to define what that is. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to do that. Um, it's one of those things that you can find lots of different definitions. At one level, it might just be about increasing access to something um, to a group of people who haven't had much access to it before. Um, and, and I guess that's what happened with women in medicine who went from just being one or two around the time of the of 1900 to now being more than 50 percent of our medical class is actually female but there's something more to that and and um, there's a, a definition that I think is more important when we're thinking about medicine and that is that it's not just about giving individuals equality of access that, that's a big part of it. But when we're thinking about medicine, it's also about the medical profession representing the public that they're serving. It's about hearing all voices in medicine. And, and that's a definition that the British Medical Association uses. Um, and maybe I'll reflect on that as, as I talk through a little bit about widening participation. So Rosanna highlighted a little bit of the context of these women coming into medicine in Aberdeen. Um, must have been at times a very lonely experience. There were just one or two in a class or up to three in a class for the first 20 years that we had um, female medical students in Aberdeen. And, and that's mirrored across the UK. Around about the time of the First World War, that started to increase. Um, it only increased in some universities because only some universities were allowing women to come in. But there was a real need for a workforce and so more women were allowed in and that was the first kind of rise in women coming into medicine, all to do with the war and to do with the workforce. So it wasn't really about their equality or their individual rights or society, it was a need. They needed more, more doctors. And things kind of carried on like that. Um, the next big change was round about um, in the 1940s. 1944, there was a report, the Good Enough Committee reported. And they um, were, this was where really the government and medical education first got fully tied in together. And, and there were a number of big recommendations from the Good Enough Committee, one of which led to people always doing what, when I graduated, was called your house job, your first year working as, as a house officer, and um, what nowadays is called the foundation programme. But it's like an internship when you first graduate before you get full registration with the GMC. But the other thing that the Good Enough report said was they said that it was necessary for any university to get a grant from the government, so to get funding for their education that they had to admit female medical students. Because there were some universities holding out strongly against that. Um, they put an arbitrary uh, percentage on it. They said approximately a fifth of the intake should be female. So for the first time, all the medical schools in the UK were admitting um, female medical students. And things kind of trundled along about the same, although there were people pushing for more and more women to be admitted. The next big change is um, probably in the 1960s. And there were issues, similar issues to uh, the issues we hear talked about in the news today, um, about there not being enough medical graduates and about the country being too reliant on an immigrant workforce. 
um, and that that was a problem. And there was an increase in the number of medical students um, allowed at that time. So medical student numbers are very well controlled by the government. Um, and so the numbers increased and where those increased numbers came from were females applying for, for medicine. And so that was the next big increase. So round about by 1980, um, it was around 40% of the intake were female and it increased every decade after that. And the current situation is that we have between 50 and 60%, but people will often quote about 55%. It goes up and down slightly. So there are more women start in medicine now um, than there are males starting in medicine. That doesn't necessarily translate into careers further down the line and where people go in their careers. And um, it, there may be a number, a number of reasons for that, but it is interesting that the career choices of the five female graduates that Claire and Rosanna looked at were in paediatrics and mental health and in missionary medicine. And, and for a long time, there were certain careers that have drawn women and have higher percentages of women working in them. And surgery, the one that Henry VIII said, women shall not do surgery, um, has been one of the ones where it's taken a long time before women have established a firm foothold. And in fact, the numbers are, are now increasing. So this journey for women keeps going on. But widening participation, is it only about women? Well, no, it's not. It's, it's about other um, groups as well. And, and over the years, there have been a number of um, lobbying groups for different cohorts of people who have been underrepresented um, either in higher education or in medicine in, in particular. So there have been um, pushes for ethnicity, there have been um, pushes for um, people with particular backgrounds and, and of particular note and discussed most frequently is socio-economic classification. So it is the case that where um, people come from a more deprived background in terms of finance and resources, there was less um, going into higher education and much, much less going into medicine. In actual fact, medicine um, has fallen behind um, pretty well every other part of higher education um, and this was highlighted quite significantly um, really only about 12 years ago. Um, there was a report which said that medicine had fallen way behind and 80% of medical students came from 20% of the schools in the UK. 20% of the secondary schools. And a great many of those secondary schools, not all of them, but a, many of them were independent schools. They weren't necessarily state sector schools. Um, and, and that's prompted the medical profession um, to really begin to look at what they can do about widening participation. It's been a social uh, political policy um, really since for the last 30 years successive governments have committed um, different um, legislation, different sums of money to widening participation in general and that has seen an increase in other aspects of higher education um, but not in medicine uh, as it turns out. So the first time any money was given by the government to promote um, widening participation was just um, at the turn of the century. So it's really it's, it, the turn of this century, as it were, not the 20th century. So it's, it's not that long that there has been a huge amount of effort put into it. So um, we were shamed, really, I think, in, in, in medicine um, about our... Um, our ability to uh, widen participation, to have our medical graduates in the UK represent our society. Um, and the Medical Schools Council 
which is a group that every medical school um, has representation on, um, have really led the work on that. There's been other work done by the General Medical Council and the British Medical Association, but I think the real pooling together has been done by the Medical Schools Council. And um, they think back to what was said by the Good Enough Committee, who said that if somebody is capable of being a medical student, there shouldn't be a barrier to them doing that. It's not saying that everybody can do medicine, but if you have the capability, you should have the opportunity to do it. So what have the Medical Schools Council done? Um, in 2014, they published a report um, called Selecting for Excellence. And in that report, they um, pulled together all the evidence that there was um, to look at what the data was, who was getting admitting to medical school, and what process was there for admitting people to medical school, and what evidence was there for the way that we chose people to come into medical school. And some of the work that contributed to that report was done here at, at the University of Aberdeen. So Professor Jen Cleland, who leads our Centre for Healthcare Education and Research and Innovation, um, did some of that work. And um, that work is continued now by one of her PhD students, Kirsty Alexander. Um, the kind of things that Selecting for Excellence highlighted was that there were lots of people doing initiatives and widening participation. There were lots of people giving information to medical students or prospective medical students. They were giving information to teachers and guidance staff. But it was variable. It was coming from lots of different directions. It wasn't consistent. Some of it was up to date. Some of it was out of date. Every medical school had its own way of describing on its websites what the admission process was. Sometimes that was clear, sometimes it wasn't clear. There really wasn't a consistent pathway of information and a consistent way of getting the information out as to why the application process was the way it was. So they did some work at that time um, which uh, committed really to improving things and to making the Medical Schools Council the, the, the primary source, the gold standard source for information for anyone who had a stake and wanted to find out about what to do in medicine. So the last report they published, which was in 2017, they have an ongoing committee um, that has representation from all the admissions teams, the admissions experts across the UK. They now have published, I think they have 15 different fact sheets and um, videos for prospective medical students. They have a range of resources for teachers and guidance staff with exercises that they can do for their students who might be thinking they want to go into medicine. They have commissioned further research on what kind of data is, is appropriate to work out whether somebody is widening access. They have commissioned research to look at the various methods that we use for admission and how we use that and are we using that in the best way for, forwards. They've engaged with medical students. Many medical schools have societies now, medical student societies, and these are medical students who are interested in widening participation. So our society, the Aberdeen Medics Outreach Society, they did do a lot of work with schools and also with mentoring students who come into medical school to help them. Because it's not just about getting into medical school, it's also about having a successful pathway going forwards. So there, there's a huge amount of work and, and, and there, there's, there's much more work that I can talk about and answer questions on if people are interested. But um, there's a lot more to do. So the focus so far has been on 16 to 19 year olds. But we know if somebody is going to prepare really well and is thinking about applying for medicine, sometimes that journey starts in primary school. Um, and it's about getting, finding out about the profession, about thinking about which hires you're going to take. Because if you don't choose the hires that are required for medicine, 
and by 16 you've made those decisions, then you might miss that opportunity. Um, there is also then that work about what is the right kind of support to help people have a successful career. We've heard about the mental health issues in medicine. So that's not just widening participation, that's about everybody in the medical profession. What is the right support for people to have a successful career? So there's a lot more work to be done. I think I'll stop talking there because Stephen's going to talk some more, but I just want to highlight that while we might have a vision for what we want in society and, and fairness, it is often other things that drive things forward. And by and large, it has been the needs of the workforce that have improved widening participation in medicine. And what I hope is with Selecting for Excellence and the Medical Schools Council that actually we're now in a position where we really can take things forward on an evidence base and truly um, get the profession that, that I think the country deserves. So now I'm going to hand on to Stephen. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to speak for five minutes on women in medicine. It feels a bit strange talking about women in medicine being a man. Um, but a bit about me, first of all, I'm a GP. I work at Calcis Seat Road and I've been a GP for 32 years. Um, my professional career has been very much influenced by women. Um, as you'll hear in a minute, I work in a very uh, female-dominated profession now. Um, but I was bo born and brought up in a, in a medical household. In fact, my mother was a GP. She went to uh, Aberdeen University. She went in 1953, qualified in 1959. She was in a class of 70 and there were 10 women in the class. Now, her university career was a very positive one, but the thing that she remembers is that um, she went to Albine, she was positively told not to do medicine. It was not the ladylike thing to do. The girls from Albine didn't do medicine, but my mum persisted, and she became a GP, and was a GP until the middle of 1980s. And in fact, was one of the very few female GPs working in the city and the shire in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, I've also had the great pleasure of being married to a GP for over 30 years and I have heard all the ins and outs of a general practice in her various roles. She, um, she was a, a locum, a trainee, a retainer and a partner at Holborn Medical Group for many years. So that's my, I suppose, my qualifications for speaking about, about the med women in medicine. I'd like to talk about general practice because that's what I know about. And the, the, the thing that's really, really striking about general practice is when I joined Calcis Medical Group in 1987, um, there were eight doctors um, and there was only one of them was a woman. And that was, what was, the, that was the picture across the city. Um, we now have 40% more patients. We now have 11 doctors. But seven of them are, sorry, eight of them are female and three of them are men. So in general practice and primary care, the pendulum has completely swung over the last 20 years to um, a workforce that is primarily women. Um, in fact, the national statistics are that 60% of general practitioners are, are now women. And women overtook men in 2008. Unsurprisingly, a higher percentage of them work less than full-time because they've got family commitments. So they would generally work five to seven sessions a week. But the other interesting thing is that in out-of-hours work, it's almost 50-50 now. So you, it's 50% women and 50% men. And actually, if you think about GMEDs, which is operating tonight, you're more likely to see a nurse at GMEDs so actually, I think you know, the, the, the workforce out of hours is, is, is now probably a majority of women. I just mentioned that just to give a comparison with secondary care. Now, I'm not an expert in secondary care, I don't work in secondary care, but the, the st statistics I have at the moment is that probably around about 35% of consultants are female. But as reflecting on what Rona said, the thing that's been striking over the last few years is the growth in the number of female consultants in a number of specialities. And that has really, really improved over my working lifetime. I mean, there was always good representation in obs and gynae, paediatrics, pedi pathology and psychiatry. And some other specialities are a bit slow, like surgery, but actually now it's quite commonly you'll get a letter from a, a, a surgical female specialist. And I know several of them in training in Aberdeen. 
So again, that there is that there is now that flow of of women coming into the hospital specialities and I'm beginning to populate specialities that were less popular. I wonder why general practice is so attractive to women. Why, 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 why have we got so many uh, women in general practice? And actually, it's going to continue because there are 89 trainees in Aberdeen at the moment doing general practice and 11 of them are men. So uh, <laughs> I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> um, and actually, I, I work in a partnership which is primarily women, and it's great. I don't have a problem with it. I think, it, I think women have a, have a huge amount to um, offer um, to, to us as a partnership and, us as pati and, and to our patients. But it, it, there is a tremendous sea change um, within our profession. Anyway, why, why, why is general practice so attractive? Well, there are some obvious things. It is easier to work part-time in general practice than it is if you're a consultant surgeon. We have a doctor's retainer scheme, which um, allows women with domestic commitments to work two to, two to four sessions per week. So that really suits um, a woman who've got young families. Um, it supports, supports these doctors who don't want a substantive, substantive co commitment, but also as an educational component. So they can come and work with us two to three sessions a week, and they get some mentoring, they get some support. And as Claire was saying, Mentoring and support of junior doctors is really, really important because the job is stressful. It's stressful across there. It's stressful where I work. And if you're a young doctor working with uh, challenging patients, you need that support and mentorship. And hopefully that's encouraged people to stay within the profession. Um, job sharing happened. It happened first, I think, in West Hill. So now the opportunity to work as a job share. When that happened in the 1980s, that was revolutionary. I think also in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, we've, we've been very fortunate that we've had some very strong, positive female role models as doctors and trainers have encouraged uh, women to come into the profession. And simple things have helped. There's been an, a, a, a huge growth in childcare and nursery provision, and the, this, this is important, and better maternity leave. A colleague of mine in the 1980s um, got six weeks maternity leave. And then she had to come back and work full time. Now my partners would get six months maternity leave and then they, come, they would come back. So the, the, the opportunities for maternity leave, maternity profession with a, a, a nursery provision encourages people to come and work in general practi practice. And it's interesting to reflect, if, to reflect on, on hospital consultants. Perhaps if there was more of an opportunity to work flexibly, um, opportunity to continue your career after maternity leave. Maybe these things are, are out there and available now, but that, these are the sorts of things that enable people to, come, to, to re remain in the profession and continue their career. I think that just to finish up, it's quite interesting to look at women in elected roles. So if we look at women in doing things like being presidents of, royal, of important royal colleges, again, there's been a sea change in that over the last few years. Um, just off the top of my hat, the last three presidents of the Royal College have all been women. Um, we've recently had a, a president of the Royal College of Physicians who's been a woman. And the current professor of the Academy of Royal Colleges, which is, a, I think, a really big job, is also a woman. Um, and the current chief medical officers in England and Scotland are both women. Dr. Calderwood in Scotland and Sally Ir uh, Irvin, or Sally somebody, is the chief medical officer in England. So actually, when you look at these roles, which you're elected into, you're, you're elected into these, into these uh, presidential jobs by your peers, women are, are, are increasingly well represented. I think if you, if you contrast that with leadership roles into which you're appointed, so that would be things like medical directorships, um, clinical leads within, within some specialities, um, Med, a, a chief executive type jobs, I think women are less re well represented. Um, but maybe that's something that's going to change. So um, that's all I really wanted to say. It's been a, in my career, it's been a, a tremendous privilege to work with so many women and I, I, I love working with my female partners. I like a few more men, um, and if, but um, it, it's great. Um, so I'll leave it there. And I think, are we gonna wrap up now, Claire? Or? All right. right.
Thank you very much. We're going to have a short break now, um, 10 minutes break, so feel free to get more refreshments. And also, as Rona mentioned, there's a little display in the atrium towards the right under the stairs, which is related to tonight's topic. So feel free to go and have a look. Thank you.